Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about Stephen Snedger. Of all the cases I have investigated and researched for this podcast, none have drawn me in or have been more wild than this case. There are so many twists and turns in this case that volumes of books would have to be written to jot down everything that either went wrong or evidence that turned up later on. This case reads like a script for a Hollywood movie. Some examples of unanswered questions that still resonate with this case even today include what happened to the one million tucked in the trunk of Steven Snedger's Mercedes, the mysterious map with an X, a two-timing hitman hired from Soldier of Fortune magazine, a plastic body dumped in the, and I'm sorry I'm going to butcher this, Oklaawa River, lots and lots of cash, some in a suitcase and some in paper grocery bags. This whole bizarre tale started with Steven Snedger himself and the murder of his daughter, Laura Morris. Now, Stephen Snidger's background is hard to pin down. I couldn't tell you exactly what is truth and what isn't. What I do know is his past is murky. There are rumors of drug running and work as an FBI informant. He had made enemies in the early 1970s when he was on the lam from the FBI, then again during his quick rise in the waste oil business, and a third time running some, as it was stated, cloak and dagger venture with Cuban dictator Fidel Castro that he never discussed much. For a two-year period, the family lived in hotels in the southwest under fake names, so Steve wouldn't have to face charges involving a tractor theft ring and the death of a deputy sheriff in Port Clinton, Ohio. Sadly, there is very little information in regards to these matters, so I can't elaborate any further on these incidents. After Steve was finally caught in Houston, the FBI dropped its charges against him. No one could explain why. Sergeant Mundine, who investigated this case and who I will speak about later, stated that he thought, based on records he'd seen, that a deal was cut between Snedger and the FBI. Mundine also never got a straight answer from the FBI in regards to this matter. To me, it's weird that they all of a sudden dropped the very serious charges against Snedger. I mean, no law enforcement agency I know of would drop charges of being involved in the death of a police officer, unless there was a very good reason to do so. In 1978, Steve landed penniless in Indiana. By the time Laura had vanished three years later, he was a millionaire several times over, and this is according to Indiana detectives who obtained his bank records. The source of his fortune is unclear, and this is where things get a little bit interesting, because Steve dropped hints about its origins, but some of his relatives, however, were more blunt about it. His father-in-law, for example, told Mundine at one point that Steve, who was a pilot, frequently flew drugs out of Havana. Steve, when asked about this, would only say that he knew Castro real well and that his acquaintance was business, which to me indicates that he was doing some kind of shady business with Fidel. I mean, you don't go from being penniless to becoming a millionaire overnight without some kind of easy way to make cash, and drugs would easily make you rich overnight if you were smart and knew what you were doing in that dangerous world. Steve's oil and recycling business, named the JNS Oil Service Company, began booming in 1979. Two businessmen, Tony Lambert and Tony McCullough, tried unsuccessfully to buy it from Steve just before Laura vanished. All three were bitter about this outcome, the reasons for which, from my understanding, was twofold. One was that the financing at the last minute fell through for whatever reason. The second is that Steve and his wife, by that time, had wanted to move to Florida and were trying to sell this business and move on with their lives. And because the financing fell through, they were unable to do this, but they eventually managed to move to Florida anyway. Steve also suspected them and Laura's disappearance as retaliation for their deal falling through. Steve's wife's Trudy also suspected them of having something to do with it. Sadly, Laura's home life was far from what you'd call the perfect home life, the very loving home life you would expect in a family. Laura had married a man her parents didn't like, an unthinkable act for the daughter of parents bent on ruining their children's lives, which is exactly what Trudy and Stephen Snedger did. The way Mundane explained it was that Stephen and Trudy wanted complete control. They put the money up, but the kids had to give them the authority to dominate and do what they wanted, not what the kids themselves wanted, which is an extremely toxic and abusive mindset. What they wanted was for Laura to leave her husband, a high school classmate by the name of Bryce Morris, which she did. Then they pressured her to move with them to Florida in 1981. This time she said no. Mundine was quoted as saying that Laura was, and I quote, the black sheep. She spoke a piece and talked back, and she paid for it, end quote. 
Now, from what I know about Stephen Trudy and from what I've researched, they were used to getting their way and they weren't used to being told no. To give you an example of how bad the abuse was, just before the move, a neighbour reported seeing Steve waving his arms and screaming curses at Laura in the backyard. Then he stood on her toes and spit in her face. Not exactly what I would call a loving father and daughter dynamic. It's also very telling as to what kind of man Stephen Snedger was. It would also be the last time Stephen Snedger would see his daughter alive, but not the last time for Trudy. She had arrived from Florida unannounced on August 10th of 1981 at the Greenfield, Indiana home where Laura lived. The police at the time, their working theory was that they thought that Trudy's visit was timed to hit off Laura's reconciliation with her estranged husband, which I tend to believe. At 11pm, Trudy and Laura returned home, and shortly thereafter, Trudy retires to the master bedroom of the family resident. Trudy told police later she had dinner with her daughter and then went to bed. When she woke at 6am, she found the lights in the television on, the sliding door ajar, and Laura's bed unslept in. But there was no Laura. Trudy later told detectives that the last time she saw her daughter Laura, she was wearing a long white t-shirt and lounging on the sofa. Deputies called to the scene seven hours later, found no evidence of foul play, and everything pointed to a young woman who was just out having a fling or was out for the night. Laura's car was outside, her person and belongings were present in the home, and the patio door was ajar. Alarmed, Trudy contacts the Hancock County Sheriff's Department, and Sergeant John W. Mundine is dispatched to the scene. He plays a major role in this whole bizarre case. Mundine said, and I quote, Then her mother said that Laura's pocketbook was still at home. A big red flag came up in my mind. Mundine also said, and I quote, I made the remark to Trudy, I believe that a woman's pocketbook is like a minister's Bible. They don't go anywhere without it, end quote. Mundine also made this very cryptic remark about how Trudy looked at him funny and claimed he knew why. Then, when he thought about it later, he then treated it for what it was, a homicide. A check of the family phone records revealed Laura spoke with her ex-husband Bryce Morris twice after Trudy had allegedly gone to bed, once just after 11pm and once shortly before midnight. Bryce's account of the content of these conversations, for reasons I'm not too clear on, has never been publicised. There were some strange things going on in the days leading up to and after Laura's strange and sinister disappearance. For example, on August 12th, two days after Laura's disappearance, Trudy Snedger received a phone call from an unknown man who vowed, and I quote, I'm going to get you, sucker, end quote. The next day on August 13th, Trudy received a phone call from a woman sobbing and making sexual innuendos. The call was taped. Trudy, Steve, and Bryce Morris all agree the sobbing woman is Laura. This has never been explained, and as we get into the case later, this becomes a focal point later on because this is in complete contradiction to when Laura's body is actually found as to whether she actually made the phone call. There are some people that think she did make the phone call. There are other people that are not so convinced she did make the phone call. I'm up in the air as to whether this phone call was actually legitimate or whether they actually made a mistake. But I mean, you would think that Trudy, Steve and Bryce, who are all very close people to Laura, would know what her voice sounded like. Unless, of course, the voice was so distorted on the phone that they wouldn't know that it was her. But this phone call does bring up irregularities on the time of death, Laura disappearing for the eight months she was missing. There's just a lot of conflicting contention around that phone call. We'll get into that a little bit later. There were several psychics involved in the case. However, this information failed to impact the investigation in any meaningful way. Another interesting fact was that a former classmate of Laura and Bryce Morris was a rapist on the run from the FBI at the time named Ricky Dean Arkers, who would ultimately be eliminated from suspicion in Laura's murder. As is common among the loved ones of missing persons, the Snedka clan took polygraphs to eliminate family members from suspicion. But the caveat to that was they paid for their own lie detector test instead of using a police polygrapher, which to me seems a bit incongruous because if you pay for your own, it's like paying for someone to say nice things about you. The person is being paid by you so you can dictate the outcome and the person won't say no or say anything bad about you because A, you won't pay them and B, they have a kind of an obligation to not say anything bad about you and not say, oh, well, he failed the polygraph test because if he or she says anything against what you want them to say, then you're not going to pay them and they lose the money. So, of course, if you know you pay for your own polygraph test, that person then has an obligation to do what you want. So that's why I find it a bit interesting that they paid for their own lie detector test because then the person would go, oh, yeah, Mr. Snedger and Trudy and everybody else passed because they're being paid to do that. If it was a police polygrapher, on the other hand, a police polygrapher plays it straight down the line because they're not being paid. They don't have a vested interest in it. They're completely straight. They're completely unbiased. Another interesting fact was Stephen Snedger gave the Hancock County Sheriff's Department 10K in cash to protect his family, according to Sergeant Mundine's Orlando Sentinel interview, and I quote, We used a lot of that money to watch Steve, end quote. I'll elaborate on this shortly, but this is what I meant before about how Stephen Snedger came off to me as the type of guy that always got his own way, and he just threw money at all of his problems or whatever his problems were. This is one of those cases because not only did they pay for the lie detector test, he then tried to pay the police 10 grand in cash and didn't think that there was anything
anything wrong with that. I mean, if you walk into a police station and you tell a police officer, I'm going to give you $10,000 to find this person or look after my family, unless you do it through the official channels, it's going to look like corruption because now you're paying a police officer to work for you. And there's all sorts of legal problems with that. There's all sorts of problems because if anything happens during the time and you've paid this police officer, from the outside looking in, it's going to look like corruption because you're paying a police officer to do something. It'd be like paying the prime minister or something to do something for you. Unless it's done through the official channels and people know about it and, and it's all legitimate, people are going to raise their eyebrows. So I find it very interesting that, that Steve thought he could just walk into a police department or sheriff's department, pay 10 grand in cash and say, I want you to work for me and do this. It's just another really weird angle to this case. Another really strange incident that was really weird. I mean, this case gets more weird the more you get into it. A long-haul truck driver was certain he'd been given a ride to a hitchhiking Laura Morris, a sighting that was discounted by her family for reasons I'm not too clear on. What was even more odd about this was that Sergeant Mundine traveled to Lake Charles, Louisiana on the Snedgers family's dime, which is even more suspicious, to convince the truck driver to withdraw the sighting and threaten to charge the trucker with bigamy on an un related matter despite a blatant lack of jurisdiction to do so which to me is really weird and I have no idea why Mundine did this and to my knowledge this was never investigated although I bloody well think it should have been because you've now got a police officer that's been paid by the Snedger family to convince the truck driver to withdraw his sighting now that can be construed if taken at face value as witness tampering because now you've got a police officer you've paid to go down to Lake Charles Louisiana to tell this truck driver to knock it off and to forget that he ever saw or anything and then the police officer then threatens to charge him with bigamy on an unrelated charge that he had no jurisdiction to do so that to me from the outside looking in looks like witness tampering for whatever reason it was never investigated so we'll never know why he did this but munden the more that you look at him and the more you investigate the case the more it looks like munden is really an interesting character and i think that he knows a little bit more about this case than what he lets on because i mean why would you go down to lake charles louisiana on the sneakers family dime to convince the trucker to withdraw the sighting and then threaten him with a charge. I don't quite understand that. To me, that looks a little bit dodgy. And that's why I'm thinking, you know, what's Sergeant Munden doing here? I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, we don't know the full story. There could be a very legitimate reason behind this. But to me, with the way and what with the evidence I've seen of it and what I have seen of it, it looks a little bit suspicious. It gets worse because a few days after Laura, who was 22 at the time she vanished from her Royal Indiana home, Stephen Snedger walked into the sheriff's office and dumped $10,000 in cash from a brown grocery bag onto the desk of the astonished chief deputy, which was Mundine. Stephen Snedger knew Laura was dead the instant she disappeared. How he was able to know this, we're not too sure. Whether he just had a gut feeling or something, we're not too sure. He told the cops so. He was convinced that somebody had grabbed his daughter to get back at him. He wanted dozens of people watched 24 hours a day. The Hancock County Sheriff's Office couldn't do it with only a force of 15 deputies. This is when Steve strode in with the money and told the police officer behind the desk to pay reserve officers to do it. Steve was acting so freaky at this point that John Mundine, the then chief deputy, just scooped up the cash and claimed that because of Steve's behavior, they used a a lot of that 10 grand in cash to watch Steve himself. Three weeks after Laura's disappearance, people started vanishing that her father suspected it killed her. The first to go was Tony Lambert, one of the pair who tried to buy Steve's oil business. Steve hatched this harebrained scheme three weeks after Laura vanished to invite Lambert to an out-of-town business meeting and, and I quote, work on him, end quote. The idea was for Steve to fly his plane to New Orleans, lure Lambert there on the pretext of making him a manager of his new waste oil business, and twist his arm for the truth about his involvement in Laura's death. Steve would tell New Orleans authorities that he did indeed fly to New Orleans and meet for 30 minutes with Tony Lambert. He said Lambert denied having anything to do with Laura and left mad when he realized he'd been snookered into coming. See, this is where things get weird though. Steve said he last saw Lambert speed away in a red Cadillac with a young blonde driver. Later he would say it was a green with a blonde and then it was a white one. Much later Mundine would piece together another version from some of Steve's friend and relative. The story is that Tony Lambert went for an airplane ride over the Gulf of Mexico with Steve and didn't return. Then on April 15th, 1982, a farm hand tiling a cornfield approximately 12 miles from the Snedger residence spotted something odd among the store. At first glance, he thought it was a deer carcass. However, it turned out to be the badly decomposed body of Laura Morris. She had been shot three times in the head with a 25 caliber revolver. Her body, clad in a white t-shirt and denim cut-off shorts, was found face up with her legs apart and her arms crossed. Scattered shell casings were present at the scene, leading Sergeant John Mundine to tell the Greenfield Daily Reporter, and I quote, it's my belief that she was killed in the field. 
End quote. Although the medical examiner determined Laura had been killed shortly after her disappearance, it's not entirely certain that her body was present in the cornfield the entire eight months she was missing. The landowner was adamant her body hadn't been visible when the field was harvested in late October, early November, and there's also the matter of the sobbing sexual innuendo phone call placed allegedly by Laura three days after her disappearance. As I was saying before, this is where we get into really interesting territory because the conflicting evidence is the medical examiner determined that Laura had been killed killed in the fields shortly after her disappearance well how could she have been killed in the field and then made that phone call that's what i'm saying it, it's a little bit difficult for her to have been killed straight after she disappeared in the cornfield shot three times and then have made that phone call someone made that phone call and everyone's convinced that it was laura but then again it's possible her parents and husband misidentified her voice and the farmer and thresher somehow managed to miss her body which i don't agree with that because when you're doing like a field like if you're a farmer and you're harvesting a field you will notice you'll know your field inside and out Unless there's a drain or something, or the body got mashed up in the, in the thresher or something, I don't see how he missed the body. So unless, of course, she was killed and placed there after the farmer had done the late October, early November field harvest, I don't see how he would have missed it. Which is why I'm not convinced with the medical examiner's determination. I'm also not convinced that she wasn't on the phone, and I'm not convinced she was. It, it's very murky because we cannot say that she was on the phone. We can't say that she wasn't. It's just very, really conflicting evidence here. Things got worse, however, because Steve still suspected Lambert's partner, Tony McCullough, and having some type of involvement in his daughter's death. One day in 1985, McCullough got a telephone call in at his Indiana home from a man named Gary Stafford, who advertised his services in a Soldier of Fortune magazine. Now, for those of you who don't know, Soldier of Fortune was a monthly US magazine published from 1975 to 2016. It's best described as a mercenary-type magazine devoted to worldwide reporting of wars, including conventional warfare, low-intensity warfare, counterinsurgency, and counterterrorism. It was published by Omega Group Limited based in Boulder, Colorado, which became an extremely controversial magazine because many would-be hitmen advertised his services in the ad section of this magazine, and several high-profile murders have been attributed to Soldier of Fortune and there's been various lawsuits, such as the case of the Gun for Hire lawsuits. During the 1980s, Soldier of Fortune was sued in civil court several times for having published classified advertisements of services by private mercenaries. In 1987, Norman Wood of Arkansas sued SOF magazine because of injuries he suffered during a murder attempt by two men hired via a Gun for Hire advertisement in the magazine. The US District Court denied the magazine's motion for summary judgment based upon the constitutional right of free speech under the First Amendment. The court said, and I quote, reasonable jurors could find that the advertisement posed a substantial risk of harm and that gun for hire ads were not the type of speech intended for protection under the First Amendment, end quote. In the end, Norwood and Soldier of Fortune magazine settled his lawsuit out of court. In February 1985, John Wayne Hearn, a Vietnam veteran, shot and killed Sandra Black for a 10,000 payment from her husband, Robert Black. Black communicated with Hearn through a classified advertisement published in Soldier of Fortune, wherein Hearn solicited, and I quote, high-risk assessments, U.S. or overseas. Quote. In 1989, Sandra Black's son Gary and her mother Marjorie Iman filed a wrongful death lawsuit against SOF Magazine and its parent publishing company Omega Group Limited, seeking $21 million in redress of their grievance. The jury found Soldier of Fortune grossly negligent in publishing Hearn's classified ad for implicit illegal activity, aka murder, and awarded the plaintiffs $9.5 million in damages. However, in 1990, the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the verdict, saying that the standard of conduct opposed upon the magazine was too high because the ad advertisement was ambiguously worded. In 1989, four men were convicted of conspiracy to commit murder in the 1985 contract killing of Richard Braun of Atlanta, Georgia. The killers were hired through a classified services advertisement published in SOF magazine that read, and I quote, gun for hire, end quote. Braun's sons filed a civil lawsuit against the magazine and a jury found in their favour, awarding them $12.37 million in damages, which the judge later reduced to $4.37 million. Nonetheless, in 1992, the United States 11th Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the judgment of the jury, saying the public could recognize the offer of criminal activity as readily as its readers obviously did, end quote. The Brawns and SOF magazine settled the wrongful death lawsuit for $200,000. One consequence of the lost lawsuits was a magazine's suspension of publication of classified advertisements for mercenary work, either in the US or overseas. Tony said that the guy told him his name was Gary Stafford and I've been hired to kill you. McCullough said, are you some nut? Stafford was alleged to have said, I'm quite serious, and asked him if he would like to continue to live. McCullough said that he would love to and Stafford then demanded 
demanded $10,000 in order for him to remain alive. McCulloch called the FBI and Stafford did two years in federal prison for extortion. This is the story that Stafford told the FBI agents. He was hired by a guy from Florida to get rid of a man he felt was involved in the disappearance and death of his daughter four years earlier. For that he got $5,000 in front money. He, w- he was to get another 20000 after proving McCullough was dead. The cops then honed in on Stephen Snedgren and questioned him about this. He just smiled and shrugged but was tight-lipped about the whole incident. The next Snedgren family associate to meet a mysterious end was Charles Darwin Smith and this was really, really bizarre. He was described as being in his early 20s at the time of his 1982 disappearance. Chuck Smith had also once to work as a truck driver for JNS Oil, the Snedgren family business, but his employment was determined to have been terminated for reasons that remain unknown. Chuck then employed at the, and I'm going to butcher this name, Coquiline Service Station in Greenfield told Trudy Snedger he had had an odd encounter with Laura the day before she vanished. On the afternoon of August 9th, Chuck said Laura, a frequent customer, stopped by to purchase gas in the company of a scraggly-haired, heavily tattooed man, and according to Chuck, she appeared to be terrified. For reasons that remain unclear, Trudy allegedly suggested Smith keep this information hush-hush. However, word of this encounter eventually leaked to law enforcement. By the time the scraggly head stranger story reached the Hancock County Sheriff's Department, Chuck Smith was no longer employed at the Greenfield Service Station. According to Sergeant Mundine, at this juncture, Trudy Snedger became frantic to obtain Chuck's unlisted phone number, claiming she had a job opportunity for him. The second time Trudy stopped by the station to badger Mundine for the information, the sergeant acquiesced to her demands, sealing Chuck's fate. Mundine then made the now famous quote about how his dumb ass gave the number to Trudy. Now, now see, again, this is where I, I, I come back and I keep circling back and to, around and around to the fact that, that Trudy and Steve felt that they had this impunity to demand and tell the local police department what the hell to do. I mean, this boggles my mind. I mean, I don't know many people that would go into a, a sheriff's department or a police department, FBI, CIA, whatever, and go, right, we want you to do this. I demand this. I want that. I mean, it, it clearly comes comes off as, and I don't want to be, you know, mean about this, but I get the feeling that Stephen Snigger and Trudy Snigger felt that they were entitled to whatever they wanted because they could. They were not the kind of people that would take no for an answer. That, that's how they definitely come off to me as people that were not known for people saying, I'm not going to do this for you. They were the kind of people that if they demanded something, if they wanted something, from, be it from their kids, being it from the law enforcement, then they would get it. And to me, well, I take extreme umbrage with this because nobody really sort of looked at that. And I mean, the, the police officers mostly acquiesced to their demands. I mean, Mundine himself admitted that he did it and that he realized his mistake straight afterwards. A few days later after that, Chuck Smith received a phone call from a man who identified himself as John Rogers, owner of the John Rogers Trucking Company in Knoxville, Tennessee, allegedly. Rogers said he received Chuck's contact information Information from Steve Snedger, and he was calling to offer Chuck steady employment and a complimentary bus ticket to Tennessee, or so he claimed. Now, see, I find this very interesting because it's interesting that Trudy Snedger goes around telling everybody that will listen to her that she's got a job for this Chuck guy. And then there's a phone call from John Rogers, who's owner of this fictitious trucking company, and offering him a job, and then Chuck disappears. It's really interesting, and I find it very coincidental that at the same time that this guy is unemployed, Trudy runs around and says, I can give you a job, I can give you this, and then all of a sudden, Chuck goes, to, you know, gets his phone call, goes for the job interview at this supposed trucking company that's got this employment for him, and a bus ticket to Tennessee, and then he disappears. I find that very, very interesting and very mysterious as well. I I honestly think that Trudy had something to do with his disappearance based on that alone. On March 28th, Chuck's father-in-law dropped him at the bus depot en route to his new job at a company that investigators learned did not exist. Charles Darwin Smith was never, ever seen again. When detectives visited the bus station, they learned the ticket seller's name was John Rogers. The purchaser had likely noted the employee's ID tag and investigators theorized that he repurposed the name for the non-existent trucking company. When questioned, Stephen Snigger denied he'd given Chuck Smith's information to anyone, and apparently law enforcement attempts to tie the Snickers to Chuck's disappearance ended there. But detectives have never revealed the physical description of the person who purchased Chuck Smith's ticket to nowhere, and Tony Lambert and Charles Darwin Smith have never been entered into NAMAS, the Federal Missing Persons Database, which is rather interesting. There was another person connected with Stephen Snigger that also disappeared and, and was also never found, a guy by the name of James A. Wilkes, Steve's right-hand man, allegedly at JS and Oil. 
world. Wilkes hasn't been seen since the mid-1980s, but no missing persons report has ever been filed, and he too is absent from Namus. The only publicly available information regarding James A. Wilkes, aside from the fact that he's missing, is his approximate birth year, which is 1952, and his last place of residence in Charlottesville, Indiana. By this point, Trudy and Steve had divorced in 1983, but continued to live together in Astor, Florida. Sometime during the summer of 1986, the specific date is uncertain, Trudy told her daughter Brenda Steve had awoken her for the last five consecutive nights by jamming a gun against her head and threatening to pull the trigger. Brenda, visiting her parents in Florida, was apparently unfazed by this information, which I find really strange, and so was Trudy, apparently since after the five nights of terror, she and Steve hit the town for an evening of country western dancing. Brenda sat with her as she dressed to go, and as they left, Brenda reminded her mother to take her purse. Trudy said that Steve had enough money. Investigators believe that the night of country western dancing was Trudy's last. Although the genesis of this information is unclear, investigators would subsequently hear rumors Steve and an associate took a plastic wrapped body for a one-way boat ride on the Oklahoma River a few days later. The earthly remains of Trudy Snedger, aged 49 at the time of her disappearance, have never been located. The day after Trudy's disappearance, Steve, after spending the morning sobbing in his office, Office, led his visiting daughter Brenda to his Mercedes parked in the driveway. Later the same day, Steve opened the trunk of his Mercedes and showed Brenda a suitcase containing tall stacks of wrapped large denomination bills, $1 million in total. Steve told his daughter Brenda to retrieve the cash if he is arrested, which never happened, and the cash, like Trudy, Tony Lambert, and Chuck Norris, and John A. Wilkes, is never seen again. No one knows where the money went or who took it. There was a rumor floating around that Steve's living girlfriend made off with it, but this has never been substantiated. The investigation into Trudy's disappearance was stunted from the onset. When queried regarding his wife's whereabouts, Steve alleges Trudy left him, and for reasons I cannot fathom, none of the couple's three children, Brenda included, bothered to report their mother missing for nearly a year, which I really don't understand why you would not report her missing. When Captain John Mundine learned that Trudy left her purse behind, however, he was certain she was sending him a message because no woman voluntarily goes missing without taking her purse. He told Trudy when her daughter vanished that this was the same instance. It's kind of like deja vu. Trudy knew that the one thing that triggered Munden was the the purse was left behind so she knew well I'm probably gonna die Steve's probably gonna kill me so I'm gonna leave my purse behind so that people know that my death was not an accident both Lake and Indiana authorities knew Trudy was missing they coaxed Brenda to make a report so they could begin probing her mother's disappearance finally a year after she vanished Brenda and her dead husband traveled to Indiana to report Trudy missing the investigators believed that Trudy and her daughter fought over Laura's planned reconciliation with her husband and Trudy accidentally killed her during the tussle Laura's truck was half packed with her belongings she was found with three twenty caliber slugs in her head and one very interesting facet about this case was that Trudy had a 25 caliber gun although according to police it was discovered in 1994 that Trudy carried the same type of gun that was used to kill Laura in her purse. Soon after Laura's disappearance the gun disappeared. To my knowledge it was never located so no forensic tests were ever able to be carried out to determine if the gun was used to kill Laura. To me the timing of the gun going missing and the fact that Laura was killed with the same caliber as the type Trudy used to carry in her purse or wallet and the whole abusive family dynamic leads me to believe that Trudy killed Laura and covered it up. It was also rumoured that Trudy's father helped dispose of the body. This is based on the fact that Mundine traced a mysterious whirlwind trip by her father to the Howard Hughes Motel near Laura's Greenfield home after a 6am call from Trudy on the day Laura vanished. Why he took the trip and what was in the phone call that Trudy made to him and why he made the trip on such short notice has never been explained. Detectives thought at the time that, that Trudy later engineered the disappearance of Chuck Smith, the truck driver who took the never-ending bus ride for a fictitious job and Mundine and Dean thinks the man Smith saw with Laura before she vanished was threatening Laura. Had Judy disposed of Laura's purse, I believe the deputies would have written Laura's disappearance off as a party girl looking for a good time. She was out on the town, she disappeared, and nobody would have looked at Trudy sideways. That's why a little jolt went through Mundine when he first saw the report about Trudy's disappearance, because Trudy had left her purse behind. As I said, and he quoted... I think she deliberately left her purse, pocketbook at home that night as a sign. Mundine was also quoted as saying, she knew that she made th that mistake with Laura and it alerted police. I think she did it on purpose that night because she knew she and Steve would argue, end quote. But why would they argue is the bigger question. Mundine thought that Steve somehow found out for sure on that night that Trudy vanished that, that she had killed Laura and was responsible for everything that took place afterwards. Now, Stephen Snedeker wasn't the only one to have a watchful eye cast upon him. It seemed that the police in this case weren't immune from scandal and it gets really weird 
weird when you look deeper into it. There was a five-way officer sex tape in the deputy murder suicide that many residents felt was a cleverly staged deputy murder murder. Put simply, a plague of scandals depended upon the Hancock, descended upon the Hancock County Sheriff's Department and an investigation by the local prosecutor's office soon followed. Captain John Mundine, as it happens, got caught up in a big scandal himself. He married the wife of a murder victim whose slaying he himself was investigating. Now, it turned out that his wife, or his new wife, Neves Lyndon Mundine, got busted selling cocaine, at which point he opted to retire from the force. The subsequent investigation found no evidence Captain Mundine was aware of or participated in his wife's criminal activity, for which she served a brief and short prison sentence. In 1989, a law enforcement official in the Snedgers' adopted hometown of Astor, Florida, learned Steve was dying of cancer. Lake County Sheriff's Detective Lynn Wagner, tasked with the investigation into Trudy's disappearance, arranged to meet him for a coffee. Steve promised to leave a post-mortem confession tying up loose ends in the assorted crimes after his death. He also was found to have malignant melanoma, which killed him a year later, with n and no written confession was ever located. But, a large bonfire was spotted behind his house in the days after Steve's death. Many investigators believe the timing was not coincidental, and no one has ever figured out who started the bonfire or why. However, not every scrap of paper in the Snidger home was incinerated in the post-funeral fire. There was one final mystery that was left behind. While Steve's children were packing up his belongings, they discovered a map in Laura's funeral guest book, a large X marked on a spot near the family's Astor home. The police were certain they'd discovered the gravesite of maybe Trudy Snedger or John A. Wilkes or Tony Lambert or, hell, maybe even Chuck Smith. The Lake County officials then launched a massive dig on the Snedger property. However, nothing was found at that location. Apparently, it was a patio that had been paved over and they had to dig it up and they didn't find anything. The last grasp of Laura Morris murder investigation transpired in August of 1994. Although the explanation for this tardy notification is unknown, William Buck Etz, a Snedger family friend informed investigators he concealed a note in the Laura's coffin at Trudy Snigger's behest. Hancock County detectives dug up Laura's remains but have never revealed the contents of Trudy's last note to her daughter. And that is where the story ends. With no real clear answers as to what happened to these people and we still have no idea who killed Laura or why. With that, this case remains open. But with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. I'm your host and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time, next on Unanswered Questions. Packer was an interesting businessman insofar as he was always involved in some type of controversy, whether it be taxes or investigations into organized crime, which he somehow got swept up in at least one royal commission into the subject. Packer's name was always linked or tacked on to something, and a majority of the time he got away from the spotlight, but there are some mysteries surrounding Kerry Packer that to this day have never been explained.